Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. Today is a special Culture of Chemistry episode where we welcome back former guest of the podcast, Dr. Mark Reed. To briefly reintroduce Mark, he earned his master's degree in chemistry at the University of Strathclyde in 2011. He then went on to complete his PhD at the same university in 2015 before moving to the University of Edinburgh for his postdoc. Currently, Mark holds the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship and works at the Department of Pure and Applied Chemistry at Strathclyde. He also holds a visiting lectureship at the University of Bristol, in addition to numerous other awards and achievements. Mark joined us in one of our first Synthesis Workshop episodes to discuss the imposter syndrome, or phenomenon, and recently he's actually published a book on this topic, entitled You Are Not a Fraud, A Scientist's Guide to the Imposter Phenomenon. Today we have Mark with us to answer some questions about the imposter phenomenon, and reflect back on what he's learned in the process of writing this book. If the things we talk about today are interesting or sound like thoughts you've had before, consider checking out Mark's book to dive deeper into the imposter phenomenon. Hello, Matt. Uh, to you and to everyone watching Synthesis Workshop, thanks so much for having me back. It feels strange that we're doing this so long after the first one, not least because I don't want to get a habit of coming onto the Synthesis Workshop as a synthetic chemist by training and saying absolutely nothing about synthesis <laughs> or anything to do with chemistry. So to be bold, if you will have me back a third time, Matthew, I promise I will come on next time and speak strictly about chemistry, tell you a little bit about what our research team is doing in the realms of physical organic chemistry. But for now, I'm absolutely delighted to be having part two of our original conversation about all things imposter phenomenon, that feeling that you're a fraud, that you're underqualified, you're not good enough, and you think at any moment colleagues are going to throw you out of the workplace, having found you out. When I consider that this is part two, it's not the thing that I think is strangest. It's that when we were first discussing this and seeing the word two next to the word years, that bewildered me. I can't actually believe it's been that long. I know I risk sounding like an old man saying that, but time is moving incredibly quickly and so much has changed in that time as well on all exciting fronts. Worth mentioning on a culture episode like this one. I think selfishly, firstly, um, I've moved from one university to another, from one position to another. I have gone from last time we spoke having one kid to having two children, an entirely different ball game, by the way. And circling back to all things chemistry and synthesis, you, of course, have moved on from your academic position at Oxford into an exciting new job in industry. Um, so I hope I speak for everyone watching the Synthesis Workshop who doesn't know it already. We wish you all the very best for that new adventure. It's brilliant to see, and these are mere products of it being two years since the last time we spoke. So it's great to be back. Thanks once again for having me. Yeah, indeed. When I realize it's been two years since we spoke about this topic, that does seem like quite a long time. And for sure, I'd be happy to have you come back in the future to talk about your group's work. For now, let's dive deeper into the imposter phenomenon. So Mark, let me start with an excerpt from your book. You say that feeling like an imposter almost drowned me. On first reading this, this sounds familiar to me because when I started my own academic journey, I think I saw publications as the air that fills our lungs and allows us to move from one stage of our career to another, and I had none while others had many. From what you've learned writing this book, do you see this as a common experience? What other kinds of triggers have you encountered for the imposter phenomenon? Well, you've firstly very kindly mentioned one particular statement from the book, so allow me to read the surrounding paragraphs for context to give you a, a fuller answer to everything that you've asked. As you progress through this book, you will learn about the journaling exercise I use to help me record my own thoughts about feeling like an imposter. Together, we will look at what imposter experiences mean to the 800 plus participants from the survey research that grew out of my journaling and now underpins this book. We look closer at the unfounded thoughts and feelings of inferiority that many students and staff in higher education face. Feeling like an imposter almost drowned me. 
I share the discoveries that stopped me from digging a mental hole from which I might never have re-emerged. Feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. Journaling and studying the problem has helped me to no end. It still helps me. By treating my neurotic thoughts like any other scientific problem, I felt an incredible ease come over me when I began to understand this so-called imposter syndrome. I have learned from others who have waded through self-doubt and emerged enlightened on the other side. So that's really my opening confession right at the beginning of the book to say that before I knew how to codify and understand or even name what that feeling was, that sensation of being a fraud and about to be found out, there was a very real danger that I would have no career to speak of because that all happened for me. And this gets to your follow-up questions. That all happened for me as a first trigger when I was making a, a first big move from my PhD to my postdoc, something uh, we touched on a bit last time. But to generalize that for the audience, when you're making such a move from one group of colleagues to another, one institution to another, one set of circumstances, working culture to others, then these things essentially thrust you into a great deal of the unknown. And that in itself, the unknown, as scary as it is, then fashions itself to become a trigger to make you think that you are the imposter among the genuine, um, the fool among the experts, if you like. Now, you mentioned in particular a related point of comparison, which is that you, know, you have few papers or no papers and other colleagues have many and you think the, the paper is the sole metric of your success. Now, for certain career paths, that certainly holds the primary weight, let's not deny it. But is it the full story? Is it the only thing? Is it essential for careers outside of academia? Emphatically, no. In fact, I don't think our team member would be uncomfortable with me citing the fact that one of the last people we hired in at the postdoc level to our own research team was very forthright in explaining that they had and were aware of the fact that they had fewer publications than might be expected at that career stage. But that in was one tiny wee bit of a much bigger picture where said person had a wealth of industrial experience outside of academia before circling back. They had patents and patents pending, which would never see the light of the academic day. These things brought a fuller context and indeed served to help show that person is as competitive among other applicants. So when it comes to the imposter experience and these points of comparison, these one or two metrics that we pull out for ourselves can serve to put the blinkers on and stop us seeing the fuller picture, to stop us seeing all the things that make up the wealth of our experience and can make us competitive in the workspace that go beyond those few metrics that we might hold most dear and most traditional to the cause. In the book, I've dedicated an entire chapter, chapter seven, to what we call social comparisons. And a large part of that deals with what I've just mentioned, what you've asked about. It deals with the history of journal publications, the history of the metrics such as H-index and journal impact factor. Uh, where they came from and, and why they've come to hold the almost ethereal esteem that they do now. You know, it hasn't always been that way. And indeed, the rabbit hole I went down in researching the book was to find that chemistry, indeed academia, is in no way a privileged place for these things to play out. Metrics and holding yourself to account on a few numbers that are a small part of a much grander image. These things play out in other career paths, other worlds beyond academia uh, and other bubbles that you might as an academic or PhD student might never have seen. For example, I go into great detail about how some elements of 
psychology and social comparison were discovered during the Second World War years and looking at the comparisons that certain staff members in the army would make. Do they make comparisons internally within their division or do they compare across divisions when they're thinking about the morale of soldiers working together? It also has popped up, as I found out, to some really dark reflection in the world of uh, the chefs, cookery, cuisine, haute cuisine, high-end cooking, the world of the Michelin star. These are all, you could argue, very distinct from chemistry. And there are more stories besides that aren't just parallel at this point in time, but there are eerie echoes from the past. This is not something, this point of comparing ourselves unfairly to others is not something that is unique to our time. And the fact that it has emerged and is seeded in stories across time, across centuries, is a signal in itself that what we're talking about here is a deep part of the human experience. In other words, it's entirely normal for you to, to go into the panic and compare yourself to this person here or that person there. What we tend to do psychologically is try to compare ourselves to those people who are tantalizingly close to where we want to be. But at the same time, the comparisons that you do make can be in the instant. In other words, you see how that person is now versus how you are now. You don't really stop to think about the story of their success, how they got to there, how they got to now, what stuff they've had to put up with, what crap they've waded through to get there, how hard they've worked, where they came from. All these things that are in the richest richness of the story, but you don't stop to think about that in the instant of the comparison between you and them. But again, as I come to in chapter seven of You Are Not A Fraud, there is really only one game of comparison you can win. And it's a game that we spoke about the first time round. Comparing you then to how you want to be now. Comparing you in the past to the steps you can take to be a better version of yourself in the future. That is the only game of comparison between two people that you can ever win. Making you now better than you then yeah i really like the comparison you mentioned you now versus you then i think in my own career i've sometimes been someone that has consciously or unconsciously formed mental comparisons between myself and others and i think your suggestion that we can really only compare ourselves with ourselves at different points in our lives is an important realization to have continuing on the thread of things that tie together the experience of imposter phenomenon I'm interested in hearing about your own experience and seeing what aspects of it can be reflected in the experiences of others that you've heard from during the research for this book. Have you found your experience with the imposter phenomenon to be relatively unique, or are there many common aspects that you've identified through your research? Wow. So, you asking about the uniqueness of an experience versus the trends that you might see with regards to an imposter experience, that's a very long thread that you pull out of a very deep hole. That's a fantastic question. And in the research, I came to realize that the answer is neither A nor B, neither individual or general, but A and B, it's both. You know, in the hundreds of open answer stories that we got back about why people were triggered to feel like an imposter, what environment they, and what, what was the environment in which they felt like an imposter? Who made them feel like an imposter? Where were they when it happened? 800 people gave 800 different stories. There were subtleties, uniqueness, intricacies of their own tapestry that sung to individuality. And I come to it right at the end of the book in an epilogue, which is really a, a my attempt to recommend actions to leaders, which is that you have to first and foremost realize that whilst you can find general trends in the way people are feeling, everyone's experience is unique. 
everyone in front of you is a book that you've never read. And so it can be dangerous to generalize before you've heard someone's story to say that you know how they're feeling when quite frankly, you do not. So there is a high level of individuality. Now that said, I said this is A and B individuality and general trends. We wouldn't be able to speak about anything under the banner of the imposter phenomenon. If there weren't common strings to the bow, that is, Many people spoke about feeling like a fraud. Many others spoke about writing journal papers or high impact papers being a real point of panic and stress. To come back to your earlier question about what triggers the imposter phenomenon, what came out from those answers and what is consistent with earlier research in the space was a great deal of reflection on family influences, labels that parents or guardians can give a child among siblings, perhaps, whilst growing up. The self-imposed pressure of being the first in a family to go to university, the first generation in a family to go to university, which whilst I had a, a grandfather and more distant relatives who had been to university, I was certainly the first in my immediate family and my generation to go to university straight from school and to have that opportunity. So that was certainly a, a trigger for me, that in the book, I go into a lot more detail about the, the split in these experiences. We had many people coming to the study from the academic side of life, but also the industrial side of life. And you see different flavors of what triggers the imposter experience through those stories on both sides of that imaginary divide. In academia, many of the experiences are triggered by these moves to another level of education, people coming into university for the first time, people moving from undergraduate to postgraduate training, people moving from a PhD to postdoc training. Big moves with big elements of unknown are always going to be a trigger. Family and where and how you grew up inevitably and perhaps unconsciously will be triggers of the imposter experience. So from our study, once again, what has been very deeply rooted in my understanding of the experience and should be for everyone else is that everyone's story is unique, but together they can show us the categories of where the imposter experience emerges. Thanks a lot, Mark. It's very interesting to hear your perspective here. So let's say that I'm starting an undergraduate program in organic synthesis, perhaps a master's or even a PhD or beyond and I start to experience something resembling the imposter phenomenon. What advice would you give me? A long story short, I found so many tools and trialed so many of my own in the course of writing the book that I ended up writing a, a workbook supplement to the book, a, a journal resource that's got 18 exercises in it to help you go through various prompts to figure out various elements of why you feel like an imposter. For example, building on earlier parts of the conversation, diarizing certain people that you compare yourself to, forcing yourself to dig deeper into the story of how they got to now. There's other parts of it where we focus on looking at how you ever came to be, looking at exercises in genealogy and family trees. This sounds very random at this point but it all makes sense in the context of the book. But up front, other tools, apart from realizing you're not alone, I've mentioned diarizing your experience. There's a wealth of psychology uh, from James Pennebaker and others that show quite compellingly that being able to diarize experience can give you a heightened level of self-awareness and appreciation for the, ex the experience without over investing in what it actually means or over interpreting what it actually means. One of the less intuitive, but very, very simple tools that you can use and then pass on to others. You've kindly highlighted it at the start of this show and I may have mentioned it already, but quite simply, 
stop calling it imposter syndrome. Feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. In fact, I mentioned it in the short reading from the book at the start, right? Feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. I can't say it enough. I could have it printed on t-shirts, tattooed on my soul. Feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. That's three times now at least. <laughs> because calling something a syndrome suggests medically that it's pathological, that it's something that is as yet undefined, but it's on its way to becoming a diagnosable illness that has both physical and mental components to it. Feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. Feeling like an imposter is a phenomenon because it's a deep part, a common part of the human experience. Going further than that, to use the word experience, if you look back at some of the written and video footage from Dr. Pauline Rose Clance, one of the coiners of the term imposter phenomenon, if she and her colleagues had her time again, she would go even further to call it the imposter experience, never mind phenomenon, but even further away from anything to do with syndrome. In chapter two of my book called It's Not a Syndrome, that's what the chapter's called, I go into quite some depth because I was forced almost at uh, inquisitive gunpoint with the question of wh why do we call it a syndrome? Why are you so bothered about it being called syndrome? Everybody calls it that. Uh, and after being asked that so many times, I dug very deep into not just the academic literature, but literature speaking about imposter experiences outright. And having been coined in 1978, it was only a few years later in certain magazine publications that I found in the early 80s, what I think is the very first instance of imposter phenomenon and imposter syndrome being uttered in the same paragraph of the same article. Let's face it, syndrome is a lot easier to say than phenomenon. And from there on out, the seed was planted. The tree for syndrome grew much taller and much wider than ever has phenomenon. In the academic literature, both words, both terms are sort of uh, riding along at the same rate. But if you look at Google Trends, for example, there's no contest. Imposter syndrome is pervasive and it's quite easy from that perspective to see why it's become such a, a tight part of the culture when speaking about imposter experiences. But a fifth thing, feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. And once you get to that point, you'll start to disconnect some of the elements that will keep you thinking that you're an imposter and will quite frankly keep you thinking that there's something wrong with you when in fact there isn't. So try to train yourself to think about how to rebrand the whole thing. And once you're comfortable with that, once you can convince yourself that that in itself is a useful tool to manage imposter experiences, share it with the others. Because once again, you're not alone. Someone else will need what you have to give. Thanks a lot, Mark. So focusing on the experience of professional chemists, there's certainly a huge number of things that we're expected to learn as we progress through our careers. And the sheer amount of information that we need to ingest and that we're responsible for knowing is enormous. Does this play a role in the manifestation of the imposter syndrome for chemists? And what can we do about this? I think especially for the audience that we're talking about, I love this prompt to go more specific for the chemistry audience. And what you've asked about here, I remember quite vividly he says, knowing that he's probably remembering watching the video back rather than the live memory. But I do remember you asking a lot about the volume of stuff that a chemist might be expected to learn and to know. Um, there are more papers coming out every day than you will ever have hot meals. There's just so many different ways you can digest the literature, papers, big and small, 
from which you might be able to take snippets or you might be able to spend the day reading one in full. There is no right answer, as I hope you can hear in my ramblings here. How can you possibly understand and digest it all? Well, obviously you can't, right? So that is, for a, a start, that is deeply uncomfortable to say. I hope it's very uncomfortable to hear. So how do you deal with that? Well, well, firstly, let's come to the fact that you've asked, does that factor and triggers for feeling like an imposter? And absolutely 100% yes, it does. Now, what this ties to is, um, I've got here, I'll, I'll read another little bit from the book, because through the research and, and some interviews beyond, we dug quite deep into certain elements of data analysis to tease out some of the themes from what people were saying in their open text, their, their untamed, unscaled answers, their individual answers. But from that beautiful soup, that whole mess of words, what we did manage to find actually was an intriguing top 10 list of all the things that someone would say if they feel like an imposter. Now, this sounds like a, 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 a long way round, but I am coming to answer your question specifically here. And it's, it's a profound point specifically for the chemistry audience that you've mentioned and the sorts of things we might be expected to know. So I won't read the full list of 10, but I'll cherry pick some of the important ones for what you've asked. So in this list of common phrases among those who feel like an imposter are as follows. I'm out of place. I don't belong. I'm not good enough. And most importantly for what you've asked, Matt, I don't know enough. That, I think, in a nutshell, answers yes to your question. The oftentimes self-imposed expectation of what you should know and should not know can be the trigger. The mere fact that there is such a volume of great science out there is another part of the same trigger. But ultimately, how do you get around it? One thing, one theme we picked up on quite deeply the last time that I think is worth revisiting here was embedded in some of the questions you were asking about my own career history and our team's work. And one of the things I love is that it's, it has become increasingly difficult for others to categorize what we do over the years. Now, it, it sounds like the modesty hat is well and truly off. I'm making my head even bigger than it physically is. I realize that. Please bear with me. I'm not trying to stroke my own ego. I've just been over the years very interested in a, a very diverse range of things and for most of those years very uncomfortable with exploring things broadly when most of the time you're expected to go deep. Particularly in organic chemistry I would say the number of different reaction mechanisms, uh, transformations, functional groups, you know, to think about your program alone, look at the intricacies and variations on natural product syntheses, the diversity of the chemistry, the number of steps, the size of the teams on occasion that are required to complete natural product syntheses. Uh, is bewildering before it is intimidating, but it is intimidating. So what I'm coming to here is that being someone who prefers to be a jack of all trades rather than a master of one, I've very much been forced down the road of realizing that uh, I cannot possibly read it all. I cannot be expert at it all. But knowing enough from one area and another puts you in a very, very powerful position, an exciting position a fun position to start to synthesize stuff 
at the bridge between disciplines. If you know a bit from here and a bit from there, but if most of those two different communities never speak to one another, if you're the translator that has brought certain elements of them together, whilst knowing just enough about one and the other, the stuff that happens here is the real magic. That's the thing that, um, cue the buzzword, leads to multidisciplinary work in genuine terms. To be able to work with people that don't all speak the same scientific language, when you're forced down that road of finding the common language, the analogies that allow things to be translated from one world to another, when you explore those analogies, what you're actually doing is threading together the new stuff that happens at the boundary between disciplines. So in our case, the fellowship that I now hold that funds our team has allowed us to pivot massively away from my original training as an organic chemist, but still use that training. We now spend most of our time in a science known as computer vision. Essentially, we point cameras at chemistry and try to apply some software design tools of analytics to extract kinetic information from video footage. So bringing together chemistry and computer science in a very interesting way. During our team meetings, it's almost impossible at times to go to the whiteboard and start throwing curly arrows around because there are members of our team who've never had the periodic table in front of them as part of their training. It's that diverse at times. And as challenging as it is, that is massively exciting and something that I wouldn't trade in for the world. But why have I told you all that? Circling back to the point, circling back to the chemists, circling back to the worrying trigger that you're expected to know so much. Well, consider the comfort and the opportunity you can afford yourself if you work with the fact that you'll never know it all. But what if you knew enough from one area and then started reading something that is entirely outside of your field? Consider what exciting ground you might uncover there. I hope that helps. Yes, I really think it does. Thanks a lot, Mark. I think that aside from the knowledge that we have to acquire and eventually create when we're doing our PhDs, Another thing that can make people feel like outsiders or that they don't belong is seeing lab mates that work long, long hours. This can make us think that overworking ourselves is required and expected and even advisable. So my next question is, do you also see a work-life imbalance as being a consequence of the imposter phenomenon? And what other consequences have you come across in your research? Well, well let's just get straight to brass tacks. Organic chemistry as you've quite rightly alluded to, is no stranger to cultures of overwork. Cultures where 14-hour days is the norm. Saturday is just Friday part two, and so on. You know, certain stereotypes that many of us have heard in conversation but might not openly admit exist within organic chemistry. And let's face it, Sometimes stereotypes exist for a reason, as wrong and as exaggerated as stereotypes can be. Sometimes they are a, a signal for something that is real, something that should be discussed. We've talked about social comparisons. Of course, a point of social comparison can be, I want to work this many hours, this person's going to do double that. It would be quite easy to take this conversation into the realms of right and wrong. But let me try, whilst openly worrying about the fact that this could quite easily be misinterpreted, let me try to stick with the realms of reality. There are points in your life when you can afford to work longer hours. If you're getting genuine output correlating to the amount of time you spend on something, then of course, if someone puts in a little bit more time than you, they might get ahead in a particular direction relative to you. That's not always the case. Now, tying this to points of being a generalist to think in multidisciplinary ways, one of the things that has really helped me and I hope can help others begin to alleviate these concerns and move away from at least the toxic versions of working long hours and that being an expected part of culture 
is to think entrepreneurially. Again, I've 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 shown it many times. This is why I'm here to speak. This thing here, this book that I've produced, is in part, let's face it, an entrepreneurial venture. It's something that through a struggle, through effort, has been a new thing, a new product created for which I really want to help people. I want there to be a market for it. I want there to be customers, end users. I want there to be multiple geographies, scalability in the product so that it can help more people get out there and offer more opportunities to do more of this work. I said that very, uh, in very verbose terms, deliberately to use some of the language of entrepreneurs to think about end users and customers and scale, product market fit, markets more broadly. All of these things and uh, in other realms as well, if you think about spin out companies and such, you then think about investment and how you would pitch to an investor versus the very different world of preparing a research presentation. Thinking in that way, stay with me, can be a, a really cool way to reframe what you get out of your work. Let me get more specific. You've asked about very long hours. That is because for most of what we do as chemists, there is the assumption that to get more work out, you need to put more time in. Work and output is directly correlated to time in. But if you think about that in terms of your daily working life, all of us in this broad space for this audience we're in a line of work where you are paid a salary. You are paid a certain amount of money correlated to a rank. Let's forget that for a second. You're paid a certain amount of money every month based on an expected amount of your time being invested to earn that money. As an entrepreneur, if you start to think about elements of scale, how to get impact from your work beyond the hours that you put into it, you have to think about breaking that correlation between time and, uh, you know, let, let me stick to my directions as I did before, output and time in. If you want to create something that is scalable, impactful, and does not require you to hold the hand of the thing at every point on that scalable journey, you have to think about creating something where an intense burst of your time can be put in and then that packaged effort can create output again and again. The time has been put in, it's not put in again. The time's been put in here and the output keeps on coming. And then if you're thinking like an entrepreneur, that wave is ridden by different ways that you might market a product. So how does all of this fit in? with the imposter phenomenon, organic chemistry and long working hours. That prompt that I've just given you about tying your time to the work you've put out can then lead you to ask a productive question. What effort can I put in now that keeps returning again and again? What ways can we put in the work now and the chemistry and the research that if packaged appropriately in and beyond a publication can give impact again and again. So really what I'm saying is, is I think there's a, a gross oversimplification that probably bears out in organic chemistry because it is such, or traditionally is such a labor intensive discipline. You have to be there at the bench, making the pills and potions and the schlenk tubes and the round bottoms and to do the work up and the separations and the drying and the filtering and all of that stuff. But let's see what happens as well as another trend starts to be fully enveloped around organic chemistry, robotics, automation, digital chemistry. These things are here now and they're coming more and more en masse. They are 
helping us see that this old school assumption of long working hours can be broken and that the organic chemist as we know it is a creature that is fast evolving. Thanks a lot, Mark. So coming back to the imposter phenomenon more generally, I think we often feel very alone when we experience imposter phenomenon, but according to the research you did for your book, do you think it's actually very common? And do you see imposter phenomenon as something that can be overcome with a single, simple realization? Or is it more of something that's an ongoing and recurring challenge that requires perseverance and certain healthy mental practices? Yeah, so as it's really interesting that you more specifically mentioned this point of being alone and whether or not the imposter experience can be overcome. So we're circling back a little bit. I won't repeat myself too much, but in two parts here. Firstly, it's absolutely the case that if you feel like an imposter, you are not alone. Yes, your experience is individual. Of course it is. But there are similar stories out there and you have to speak to people to realize that you're not alone. So that came through emphatically in our own research for the book. And as I've mentioned in the book, if you look far beyond that, one of the most common statistics that you will hear used again and again with regards to anyone feeling like an imposter is 70%. A study was done once upon a time that said that 70% of people will feel like an imposter at some point in their career. It was actually from a study by Dr. Gail Matthews back in the early 1980s who looked specifically at people in the US and that's where it came from. It's cited again and again, but not, not often well tied back to its source. So our research is certainly consistent with that. Most of the time when we are talking about comparisons between different groups, it's small hair splitting amounts of difference in the realms of this. these people might feel like they're imposters 84% of the time, these other people might feel it 82% of the time. It was always comparing numbers that were at the higher end of the scale of those who would feel like an imposter. It was, it was almost never the case that we were looking at something as obvious as this group feels like an imposter, this group doesn't. So there was many, many more people who felt like an imposter than did not. Part of that is really down to the curse of doing survey research your first filter is getting people to kindly spend their time on it. And there are some people who are more likely to do survey research than others. But the fact remains that many, many hundreds of people felt like an imposter. In fact, many hundreds more approached me and just were kind enough, brave enough to say that they had felt that way, that, but they just weren't comfortable being part of uh, survey research. Uh, they didn't want to expose themselves in that way, even though, though it was anonymous. We had to take great care in that regard, great respect as well. But what it shows you is that not just that you're not alone, but there are many others out there who might never speak of it. Overcoming the imposter syndrome, as we might wrongly call it, is an interesting point. Something that I hear often, I said many, many, many times earlier in the chat that feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome. But as I have emphatically said elsewhere, and in fact, this is why I made it the subtitle of the book. This is why I've called it A Scientist Guide to the Imposter Phenomenon, not a cure to the imposter phenomenon, not a way to ditch it or to smash it or cure it. And other little blurbs that I've put out there to advertise the book, I've spoke very explicitly about the fact that this is a process of managing an experience, not trying to crush it and get rid of it forever. The reason for that is that if you talk about overcoming the imposter experience, the connotation of that is, is that when it's done, it's solved. It's never coming back. But what if you change career? What if you climb the ladder to the next stage of academia? What if you move on to industry? What if you become the leader of a group? What if you change careers entirely and move outside of science? What if you push yourself to an entrepreneurial project and you've got no experience in this space? 
there are many things that as someone ambitious you will encounter in your life because you will push yourself to do it you will consciously or not throw yourself into the unknown and always give yourself a new trigger to feel like an imposter all you're doing is creating a new environment a new instance of that old experience so to say that you can overcome it is really quite a unhelpful misnomer we need to learn to manage it because as you quite rightly suggest this is something that we want to recognize one day as an old friend it could always come back because you quite rightly could always be trying to face things that will make you feel like an imposter you will be trying to face things that are truly worthy of your effort so once again no you are not alone in feeling like an imposter but so too should you be the person to tell yourself and to tell others that this isn't something to be overcome it's something to recognize to manage and to work with feeling like an imposter is not a syndrome tell that to the others but feeling like an imposter is also something not to be overcome tell the others it's something to be managed. Thanks again, Mark. Imposter phenomenon is clearly an important psychological challenge that many face during their professional careers. And this can be an especially important thing to have in mind if you're a group leader or somebody's boss, since it can be something that your group member or employee may be going through. What advice would you have for group leaders based on what you've learned about the imposter phenomenon? So, um, firstly, I'm, I'm delighted that you've asked this through the perspective of turning the tables to look not at those who are feeling like an imposter, but those who have imposter sufferers in their care, the leaders of the world, those who have teams to look after. And I have found that deeply important over the years. I don't think I'm an expert in leadership, but as experiments to figure it out to always become better that's why i've been writing a blog on leadership since 2018 that's why i've got uh, my own little talking head podcast it's not preaching it's me trying to figure it out and because of all of that and everything that i'd learned in the process of writing the book uh, i made the closing part the epilogue of the book the outro if you like a section all about the responsibility of leaders and seven, seven principles that leaders should consider. Yes, through the guards of the imposter phenomenon and how pervasive it is, but also to leadership more generally. So in closing, if you don't mind, I've got a, another short reading from that section for your audience. I haven't read this anywhere else. That I think is a fitting way to summarize some of these points on on leadership and one of the things that you as a leader may have to consider for someone in your care who feels like a fraud so this in closing is a thanks once again to you matt for having me back and a thanks to your audience for sticking with us throughout the episode this is from the epilogue to You Are Not a Fraud, it's called The Responsibility of Leaders. And this is principle five, save their work from the fires of perfection. Consider closely the value of good enough over perfect. The imposter phenomenon is a weapon expertly crafted for inaction. In the throes of self-doubt, opportunities are missed, chances will not be taken. The imposter phenomenon manifests the ultimate excuse to keep you and your work hidden from the world. And so too, might this happen to someone in your care? This is where your generous mentorship is most needed. Alexander Pope was a poet and satirist. His landmark works swept Great Britain in the 1700s. Such was his influence on literature that Pope is now enshrined at Westminster Abbey in London, in the UK, bejeweled and celebrated in death. He's buried next to Sir Isaac Newton. The literary contributions of Pope are unquestionable, 
Still, this giant of the written word was not free from his own battles with self-doubt. From 1728 to 1743, Pope released three versions of his satirical poetic masterpiece, The Dunciad, written firstly anonymously and with pseudonyms. Before Pope ever put his name to it, the poem mocks the advances of tastelessness in Britain. It's an unsubtle and unapologetic jab at human nature. But the entire work almost never was. Immersed in unfathomable hatred of his own work, Pope came close to throwing the original draft of the Dunciad in the fire. This was the 1700s. There was no backup copy, no USB locked away, no ethereal cloud storage. Pope wanted to get rid of his work from existence. To history's aid came Alexander's dear friend and fellow literary giant, Jonathan Swift. Swift, most noted for his authorship of Gulliver's Travels, was a friend of Alexander Pope for almost 30 years. It was during some of their time together that Pope acted to banish his Dunciad draft to the flames. Swift acted, well, swiftly. <laughs> he thrust himself from his armchair, pulling the pages from the grip of the fire. The Dunciad was saved from an irretrievable fate. Pope had produced one of the finest satirical works of his time, something still celebrated today. Yet it took a deep friendship and the objective sense of another human being to avoid Pope's self-sabotage. Pope did eventually reflect on this event in the introduction to the Dunciad, saying, Without you, it never had been. So, Whose work might burn if you're not there to save it from the fire? Matt, thanks again for having me. Thanks again to your audience for listening to me talking about a whole lot of stuff that's nothing to do with chemistry. I hope it's been valuable. I hope it's useful. You can reach out to me anytime. And amongst everything else we mentioned at the start for everything that's happened in the past two years, I hope again I speak for everyone in your audience, Matt. Congratulations on everything that you've built. When we first spoke, the synthesis workshop was at a much earlier stage. The audience has grown significantly since then, as has the breadth of topics that you cover. So thanks very much for being creative. Thanks for putting that work out there. Thanks for serving others in our community. All the very best to you. All the very best to your audience. Thanks once again for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for joining us once again, Mark. If you're interested in learning more about the imposter phenomenon, feel free to check out Mark's book. You can find the links in the episode description. And thank you to you, the audience, for watching this Culture of Chemistry episode. If you enjoyed it, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast. And feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date and see you all next time.